All right, welcome to another interview episode of Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. I'm excited. I have Dr. William Attaway on the line. We're going to talk about leadership. And you know, before we get into the whole formal intro bio, all that stuff, uh, William, in your book, you talk about leading others. But the final chapter and arguably a key takeaway message throughout the book is you have to lead yourself well. Tell me about that. What does it mean to lead yourself well? And how does that impact your total approach to leadership, including leading others? You know, Roy, when we talk about leadership, it so often focuses on the people that you lead and learning to do that. And that's that's important. It's critical. But if you don't lead yourself well, you're never going to be able to lead anybody else well. It starts with you. It starts with your mindset. It starts with the systems, the processes, the disciplines that you have in your life. And that's why simple things like getting enough rest, right, the nutrition habits that you have. These things are leading yourself well in so that you can have the energy, the drive, the focus, all the things that matter when it comes to leading other people. But it always, always, always starts with you. There's so many ways that that has been true in my life. And I think one other aspect of that that probably piles on to what you said is also by leading yourself well, you're not just leading with telling people things. Yes. You're leading through inspiration yes. and being the type of leader someone wants to follow. That's exactly so I, I look forward to diving into all of this stuff more for the, the formal bio, not formerly, the formally. <laughs> uh, Dr. William Attaway is a mindset and leadership coach who helps high performance agency owners and their teams conquer challenging situations and maximize their potential with clear-minded focus, calmness, and confidence. He's coached hundreds of leaders over the last 25 plus years, including entrepreneurs, the C-suite, nonprofit, and church and, and faith leaders. He's captured uh, insights from decades of coaching in his most recent book, Catalytic Leadership, 12 Keys to Becoming an Intentional Leader Who Makes a Difference. Stay tuned if you want to check that book out. He's also hosts the Catalytic Leadership Podcast each week, where he interviews entrepreneurial leaders about the insights and wisdom they have learned so far in their journey. Also encourage you to check that out. Uh, so uh, let's let's get in the the first question because leadership is um, it is a oh what is the term I'm looking for. Um, it, it it's like a nominalization, right? It's not something that we can grab onto. It's not a physical, like, you know, I can, I can show you a book. I can show you a book and this is a book and I can point to a book, but leadership is not like that, right? Yeah. So what does leadership mean to you? Leadership, and I love how John Maxwell puts this, leadership simply put is influence. It's nothing more, it's nothing less. When people tell me, well, I'm not really a leader. I yeah. smile, and my first response is usually, well, do you have influence with at least one other person walking around on this planet? Yeah. And if the answer to that question is yes, then guess what? You have leadership. You're a leader, at least with that person. Yeah. Most of us will have influence with more than one person. So we How lead. How we use that? Yeah. So we lead in our relationships. We lead, like, as parents. We lead, Yes. Um, you know, with our significant others, with our friends, with our social groups, we lead, you know, and that's before we even start to talk about any professional or work context, even if you're an employee, yes, uh, you may lead your boss. Absolutely. At you some can point. lead up, right? You yeah. can lead laterally. It's not just about your direct reports. Okay. Yeah. And in fact, okay, this is crazy because I'm thinking back and when you and I talked on your show, which is a weird time warp, um, I, I think won't be live when this one goes live, but you know, people can figure that out, right? Um, when we talked on your show, the uh one of the things we talked about was was my very first job in uh an IT training business and how I became like a member of what we called the brain trust. And my I became a leader when I had nobody reporting to me. Yes. Um, and and so I think and I think a lot of the principles we'll talk about here are going to get into that. And like you said, it starts with personal leadership and you do these personal leadership growth plans. Mm -hmm. um, so. That's that's another term where, OK, I have a 
conception of what that is. But can you tell me what is a personal leadership growth plan? And then like, how does that play into how important is it in uh, developing our leadership? I want you to think for just a second about the business that you started, Roy. Okay. Did you have a plan when you started that business? I did not have a formalized plan. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's part of why it took from 2007 to 2010 to make it a full-time thing. Um, but I, I did have I did have some plans and some ideas, right? Um, and then I think that through time, the plans become have become more formalized. Yes. Yeah. And so since 2010, can you see that you have begun to, to exercise an intentionality there? And you have for sure and laid out, hey, this is where we are. This is where I want to be. How am I going to get from here to there? Yes. Yes. We, we know this as business owners. We know this. If you have any leadership in any team or any organization, that's what you do. You define where you are. You define where you want to be. And then you figure out how to get from here to there. Yes. That, that's a plan. The problem is when we think about a softer skill like leadership, we think, oh, they, you know, you don't have to be as intentional with that. That just happens. Yeah. You know, I have yet to meet the leader who tells me that they woke up one day and said, oh, wow, I'm a fully mature, developed leader with all the skills that I need. I don't know how yeah. that happened. I didn't mean for that to happen, but here I am. It doesn't work that way. You have to have a plan. Now, yeah. that plan could be around developing skills that you don't have yet or that need to be developed further. It could be about the networking that you need to do so that you can be surround yourself with people who are farther down the road than you are, so you can learn from them, somebody that you can ask the questions up to help you avoid some of the ditches that they might have hit so that you don't have to. It, it could be the, the, the intentional learning experiences that you're going to expose yourself to, the workshops, the seminars, the conferences, the books, the podcasts. All of these things are components of a plan. But if you do not plan, if you have no plan, I remind you of the old adage, it's tried but true, right? Failing yeah. to plan is planning to fail. Yes. So, so as you're as you're considering this plan, as you're thinking how you would structure this plan, like if I'm if I'm following along with with your approach, mm -hmm. um what is that going to look like? Maybe an example or two on an individual basis of what maybe someone who feels like they're just getting into leadership versus someone who's much deeper into their their growth journey as a leader. I work a lot with younger leaders and and okay. they, they're exactly what you're describing. They 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 don't know often exactly what they don't know. Yeah. And, and so they say, hey, I need somebody that's going to help guide me and help me understand what uh, I don't even what I don't even know I need to work on yet. We all have blind spots. There was a study done years ago that said the average leader has 3.4 blind spots. And the funny thing about a blind spot is you don't know you have it. Uh, yeah. but, every, but everybody around you on your team, they all know. Uh, they may not tell you, but they know what your blind spots are. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. My coach helps me to identify and address my blind spots. That's part of my plan. So I think a coach is critical in this, in that they're going to help you to identify and address the things that you can't see. You can't see the whole picture when you're in the frame. That's yeah. the problem. When you're in the weeds, you simply can't get a good view of the entire field. So you need somebody who's outside who's going to give you a different perspective. That's part of developing the plan because it tells you where you need to work. Like, what, what are the things you need to work on? What are the skills? What are the areas? Maybe it's conflict resolution. Maybe you're terrible at that. Maybe you avoid conflict like the plague. Maybe when some things get tense, you just like completely back off and run the other way. Okay, that's not going to help you long term. Yeah. So let's work on that. You know, maybe it's, hey, I stink at productivity and organization. Like I just stink at it. Okay, yeah. that's okay. These are skills that you can develop or they're things that you can delegate, which is a whole nother skill set. Absolutely. So can I wait, wait, what's my plan for delegating conflict resolution? <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. If you figure that one out, let me know. Yeah. That's that, there are some things a leader cannot delegate. That's yeah. Yeah. One of them. yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so how does your, uh, you, you, you 
really point out the importance of um, your personal life as well as your professional life. Yeah. So how does uh, your personal life impact your leadership in career and work and your business? You know, we, we inherited an idea from the ancient Greeks, this idea of compartmentalization, that you can yeah. wall off different parts of your life and, yeah. and they won't touch anything else. They'll just affect that one compartment. That's a cute myth. Uh, but it's just that. The fact is, every part of your life touches every other part. And if you think I'm wrong, have a bad day at home and then go to work. Yeah. And see if you are able to completely wall off what happened at home or vice versa. And you have a terrible day at work and then you come home and it's like, oh my gosh, like, of course it's going to bleed. That's because you are an integrated person. Right. Integrity yes. is the idea that all the parts of your life are lined up. They're all connected. For so many of us, we want to wall off and we have this idea that we can wall off. And what that does is it creates a fragmentation in you. And that dissonance will rub. It will create a tension inside of you. So what I teach and what I coach with my clients is, is that every part's going to touch every other part, which means you can't ignore any part. You got to be aware of all of it. That doesn't mean you're going to sure. work on everything all at the same time, but you're going to be aware of it. Increasing your self-awareness of every part of your life is the way to get to a place of health. But it yeah. starts It starts with a, with a clarity. It starts with focus. Well, if I'm going to reflect on, on this for just a second, like I know, well, for example, yesterday, it wasn't a particularly bad day at work. It wasn't anything like that, but it was a very intense day at work. And I knew that when I transitioned to family time at the end of my workday, like I used, used awareness as a word, I had awareness that I was very I activated is maybe the right, yeah. right term for it. Just yeah. I was very activated around just how intense my, my ending of the workday was. Yes. And then it took some intention to turn around and not just bring all of that activated energy to a completely different situation that had nothing to do with what had activated me before. And so there is, and it wasn't even about compartmentalization. It was about just recognizing that I had that energy and I did not want to, I, I didn't want to, you know, breach I, I like I keep wanting to think of compartmentalization, right? Like, yeah, um, it, I, I just didn't want to to push it through. Yeah. And that's that's so common, particularly yeah. among entrepreneurs and business owners. Like, you know, it's such a part of who we are. And yeah. it bleeds. It bleeds everywhere. And sometimes sure. if we're not aware, we can end up bleeding all over the people that are closest to us. Yeah. And that's Which not can... healthy. That's not going to get mm -hmm. you where you want to go. No. So here's another personal thing, and you mentioned this in your notes, and I only want to talk about whatever you're comfortable with, but I understand that your older daughter uh, went through a cancer diagnosis, and that's a huge moment in any family's life, any member, and I think, God, I can't imagine what that's like as, as a parent, um, but, but you do say that that's had a huge impact on your family, your faith, and your leadership. So... Um, I guess I, I don't know the exact question besides, can you speak to that experience and the impact that it's had? Sure. Um, yeah, yeah it, 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 it had a greater impact than anything I could put into words in a few minutes, but I'll, I'll, I'll share with you, I think, one of my biggest takeaways from that season. This was okay. about four and a half years ago. Um, okay. And my older daughter at the time was 14 years old and she started having headaches and we thought, well, maybe she's developing migraines. I've had migraines since I was about her age. And so we thought maybe that's what this is. So you go to the doctor yeah. and, you know, they do the things and give you the medicine and um, didn't help. And so we just, we kept going back and like, what's going on here? And, and ultimately they ended up doing an MRI and discovered that she had a brain tumor on the back right side of her brain. And there's no family medical history record. I mean, nothing of this yeah. kind of thing. And all of a sudden I'm in the ER with her and they're like, we got to take her by ambulance uh, to a larger hospital. Uh, here's two options. Which one do you want to go to? Because we got to get this out now. Yeah. As a parent, and you can imagine like yeah. what this does internally. 
And so we we go by ambulance to this this other hospital. We meet with the pediatric neurosurgeon, and two days later, the uh, the tumor's out. And two days later, she's home. You can believe it. Um, and then and then you wait for the biopsy to see what it was. Yeah, uh, turned turned out to be a very rare form of cancer. Only about fifty teenagers a year in the world are diagnosed with it. Wow. Uh, and so we then start the treatment journey. Uh, you know, radiation, relocating to a place where they have the type of radiation that, that she needs, uh, which for us was the closest place was in Baltimore. Uh, so, you know, living out of the Ronald McDonald house I and mean, the whole bit, like our, our world yeah. is just upended for months. The end of the story is she's doing great. Uh, she's just, great. just finished her first year of college uh, and she's, she's doing fantastic. There's been no recurrence. Uh, we continue to monitor that, but yeah. like, everything's great. With, with her today, um, I, I use the story as an illustration of something that I believe most business owners and entrepreneurs lose sight of. Okay, we get we get so focused, we get so intent on on building what we're doing because yeah. it matters and it does. What we do is is we make a difference, right? It, through what yeah. we do, no matter what you do, whether you're you're an entrepreneur, an agency owner, a leader, a team leader, whatever you're doing, you're making a difference. And I never want to. I never want to lose sight of that. But at the end of the day, at some point, somebody else is going to do what you do. They're going to sit in yeah. your chair, so to speak, right? And you're not going to do yeah. that anymore. Then what? Then what? And this is the yeah. part that we lose sight of: the relationships that are closest to us that we say we would say matter most often are the ones that we will sacrifice on the altar of success in our business and what yeah. we're leading. And we say, oh, there'll be time for that later. There'll be time for that later. And what I yeah. have seen time and time and time again is these business owners, these entrepreneurs, these, these leaders get to that point where now it's time for somebody else to do this and then they're going to retire. And the relationships that they would have said were most important, the ones closest to them, they're no longer there. Yeah. They're no longer there. I've spent a lot of time with people at the end of their lives. And, and one thing that I've never heard anybody say is, I wish I had spent more time at the office. I wish I had yeah. just hit the KPIs for one more quarter. I wish if only I would gotten that project a little farther down the field. I've yeah. never heard anybody say that. You know what I have heard? Regrets around relationships, around conversations that were never had, time that can't be gained back. Yeah. What you need to know and what every entrepreneur and leader and, and, and copywriter and agency owner, what you all need to know is this. Tom is the one non-renewable resource. That is your greatest resource that you have. It's not money. You can always make more money. You yeah. cannot manufacture more time. And so that season in my life and in my family's life reinforced that to me. Yeah. This matters. Yeah. And I'm going to make they sure that I'm bringing the best of myself into this. So that there's never a question of what matters most. Yeah. And thankfully, I mean, you you can't like reverse time, but thankfully you got more time with your daughter. Yes, I mean, first yes. off, yes. Um, yes. The last four and a half years, what a gift. But yeah, it wasn't guaranteed. Yeah. For sure. For sure. This had been a hundred years ago. Yeah. So like, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that goes... I mean, this, this this has come up in so many wisdom traditions and and so on, but Stoicism is one that I've studied, and sure. they have the whole memento mori, yeah, uh, which is which is remember you will die, and that's not a yes. negative thing. Like that's no. that's actually a very positive thing. It's it's about appreciating the moment. Yeah. Funny, uh, there's there's this new Arnold Schwarzenegger show on Netflix called Fubar, um, and it's it is not like um, you know, the highest writing or anything of like, not the greatest acting or anything, but it's, it's kind of fun. And, and actually that's one of the major themes is like, he's dealing with a situation where his work has taken him and he has missed so many years and so many relationships have struggled as a result. Um, and so part of, part of the story is him kind of trying to make that up, but, but he's, he was telling someone else, um, there's no such thing as 
or or quality time is not what's important. Quantity time is because it's all of those little moments yes. where you're there to say good night. You're there to like do this and that. And and yes, quality time is important, but it does not make up for the 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 quantity time if you're pushing yourself to work 70 hours a week so you can hit the KPIs so you can do whatever. And so it's about balancing that. Um, Absolutely. And you talk a lot about priorities in what you do or priority, yes. right? The yeah. priority, right? <laughs> yes. I think, I think that's important to, in, in this conversation because as the leader, as the business owner, the entrepreneur, even if you're just a team leader, you are setting what is most important and you are modeling what is most important. Yes. And people are following what you do more than what you say. That's that's one of those things. Like if if I have somebody who has a family situation or has a has a uh, personal situation where or, or like a health situation, some people have really push themselves, especially with remote work, really push yeah. themselves to work, even when they're feeling terrible. Yeah. So get some rest. Yes. <laughs> get, some, yes. get, get some rest. Go deal with your your situation, because I also do that for myself too, right? Like I have structured my business and my life in such a way that I've been actually since 2010, when I uh, stopped working a full-time job working in somebody else's office, I've structured my entire business around, you know, being there for picking my kids up some days of the week from school, dropping them off some days a week, being around for sports activities and things like that. Yeah. Yes. Um, so let's transition to some of the things that kind of fit more under the the, the traditional umbrella yeah. of leadership, right? Yeah. Um, I I want to talk because one of the one of the key moments in especially business leadership is hiring somebody, bringing people onto your team, right? So how do you learn if a candidate is a right fit for your team? Like you're. You say, okay, I need someone who can, we could use copywriting as an example. We need to add a copywriter to our team. Mm -hmm. So there's capability, but there's also other factors. So um, what, what are your recommendations around that? There's, there's, I, I think the hiring process can be one of the most deceptive things that we do. And I, and I, I say that with no malicious intent on anybody's <laughs> part, Yeah, <laughs> but everybody's putting their best foot forward. Right. The, the company, yes. or the team like wants you to see like how wonderful this is to work here and how great it is. And, you know, this is just fantastic. It's just delightful all the time. And yes. the candidate wants you to say, oh, hey, I, I'm the best person you were ever going to have for this role. You would never regret hiring me. And everybody's bringing their best foot forward. And then you match and then it's like a marriage. And all of a sudden you wake up and you're married and you're like, wait a minute, you do what? You think <laughs> what? You're what? Whoa, yeah. <clears throat> this is this is a challenge when it comes to hiring. Yeah. How do you know what you need to know before you get into that situation where you're like, I've got serious buyer's remorse here. Like, this is not what For, I wanted. For sure. There's, there's five C's that I look at when I'm looking at a team member. And this is what I what I tell my clients that I'm coaching. Like, look at these five C's because these, they used to be three C's and I've learned over time, there's two more that I needed to add. So now there's five. We'll okay. see in 10 years how many there are, but today there's five, <laughs> right? The first one is competency. <clears throat> competency matters. This is like the admission ticket to get in the door. I yeah. need you to be a copywriter. That means you need to be able to write copy. I mean, yes. that's that's just a simple thing, right? You need to do this at a certain level where you're going to meet minimum expectations at minimum. Huh, yes. Right? That's one. But that's not the very first thing that matters most to me is the competency. The first thing that matters most is your character. Your character is critical. I need to know that you're going to do what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it. That yeah. type of integrity in your words and your actions, between your words and your actions, that matters as much or more than what you're going to end up producing. Yeah, I mean, that's for sure. That's counterintuitive. But character is something that is either there or it's not. Yes. And this is why reference I, checks matter. <laughs> I, my kids in their school, they're actually teaching them. This is tight and I'll keep it tight. Uh, they're, they're teaching them that integrity is behaving when nobody's looking the same way that you would behave when under supervision. Yes. And that that becomes character, right? Yes. Um, and and 
Yeah, perfect. Okay, so we have competency, we have character. Yeah, the the third thing I'm going to look at <clears throat> is commitment. <laughs> I want to know that somebody's going to be committed to our team, our company, our organization, our mission for a bit. Now, I'm not saying yeah. I want you to be here for the next 40 years. That's not realistic. But I do need to know that next week somebody's not going to offer you ten thousand more dollars, you know, or or another buck an hour or whatever, and you run yeah. down the street. Like there needs to be a certain level of commitment that you're going to be here for a season. Everything yeah. is for a season, and I the learning to talk in terms of seasons was one of the healthiest things I ever did. Uh, I used to think, hey, this person's going to join our team and they'll be with us for the run. Yeah, yeah. they're with us for a season. <laughs> Everybody has seasons, and let's think that way as leaders. It's so much healthier, right? So you got yeah, you got, I like that. You got competency, right? You got commitment. Uh, the fourth one is chemistry. Um, okay, chemistry. Do you have chemistry with the rest of the team, and do you have chemistry with me? Here's yes. the thing: we're going to spend some time together. We're going to work together, and if our team does not have chemistry with one another, and mm-hmm. I'm talking in a healthy way. Uh, It's going to become evident in our work product. It's going to become evident in our meetings. It's going to become evident in our relationships. That matters. Now, you can take that and you can take it in unhealthy directions. And that's not where I'm going with this. I just want there to be a sense where we enjoy spending time together. You know, that's that's important. If if this is why I include our team in uh, hiring interviews, it's not just okay. Like I include the team. They're a part of the process. Uh, yeah. And once somebody moves as far down the process as, as I'm like, okay, now it's time. They come in, they meet with the team because then you get the benefit of what everybody else on your team is going to see and the questions they're going to ask and things that they hear that you might not see or hear. For sure. For sure. And I think there's a couple of layers of chemistry here. So for one, there's just like, hey, do we enjoy spending time together, right? Right. right. The, uh, the other thing that I think is worth paying attention to, and for me, this is as, as much like when I think of like, we could flip this around hiring clients mm-hmm. oh, as, yeah. as okay. getting hired by, right? Uh, one of the things that I figured out, you know, through some trial and error is that a key element of chemistry for me is uh, direct response orientation. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. um, and 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 this falls like I don't know or if you're familiar with the Diltz logical levels of change uh, from Robert Diltz. No, uh, he, he talks about. Um, I, I don't want to go too deep into an explanation of this, but but we can change like what environment we're in, but it doesn't fundamentally change who we are as a person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, and and there's there's things like behavior, which is a little bit deeper. Capabilities and skills is a little bit deeper. Beliefs and values is a little bit deeper. Identity is a little bit deeper than that. Yeah. And and when somebody gets into direct response, often it almost becomes at an identity level. I'm a direct response marketer, right? Versus I am a brand marketer or whatever. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot. Well, okay, we have way fewer identity statements than, for example, behaviors right? Or Mm. capabilities. Um, But when we're looking for chemistry, there is, hey, do we like to hang out together? But in a lot of teams, in a lot of cases, it's more like, do we share an identity statement, right? Yes. And so in some organizations, that might be faith. In some organizations, it might be direct response. You know, in some organizations, it might be something else entirely. But yeah. Bingo. And I think that leads nicely into the next C. The last okay. thing, which is culture. Yes. Every, every team, every business, every organization has culture. You either have a culture that you have been purposeful and intentional about, that you yeah. guard, that you protect and you're, and you're focused on, or you have a, a culture that you did not mean to have. But either way, you have a culture. For sure. For Once sure. you've identified it. And you say, this is who we want to be. This is where we're going to move forward together. We're all on the same page in this thing with this identity. Yes. Now you have something to measure hires against, candidates against, and say, do you share our culture? Is this as important to you as it is to us? Because we're not going to change. Like This this matters (laughs) to us. This is a big deal. If you want to be a part of this, we want to make sure this is important to you too. Yes, for sure. That's excellent. Okay. Um, 
at the risk of, I feel like that conversation could actually continue for the next hour. <laughs> yeah. At the risk of, yeah, five no. C's are important. I mean, it, for really... me, that's the benchmark. That's the report card that I'm measuring every candidate against. I'm doing a hire right now, and okay. I was just yesterday going through this process, like thinking through, okay, are they hitting? Are they hitting on all cylinders on all five of these? And often, somebody will hit four and not five. Yeah, that's a, that's a no. It's just a no. Uh, you know, yeah. there's no other way to say it because if you bring them in and they say, well, maybe they'll get there, maybe and that's like somebody who's going to get married to somebody. And they're like, well, you know, once we get married, they'll change. Yeah. Good luck with that. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm thinking, OK, if they don't have the competency, I'm not going to hire them. Right. right. If they if they don't have the character, I'm not going to hire them. And all the other things could be right if they don't have the commitment. Um, it, okay, you want to be here for what the next thirty days? Right. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> now it's it's a little bit different than saying like, okay, we have this ninety day period where it's yes. it's an opportunity to see if it's a fit, and we're both going to make a decision at the end of the ninety days, which I oh, really yeah. recommend for any kind of ongoing oh yeah um, relationship. Um, if if we don't have chemistry, you yeah, have like okay, no, no, and if their culture, especially if there's some um, you know, some major conflict or something like I, I ended up stopping working with someone just because they really, even though they were one of the most skilled marketers that I will ever meet in my entire life, mm. they had complete disdain for the people that they were selling to. Oh, and they were incredibly effective at selling to them. But for me, it was like, like it made me feel sick to my stomach when they talked about their, their, uh, customer base. And I was like, Oh, so culture fit. No, like, yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned measurement and evaluation, right? Yeah. So talk to me about evaluation and measurement in leadership. What are some approaches to, to evaluation in leadership? Um, like, yeah. yeah. So there's this sense that experience is what makes you better. Yeah. And Roy, I think that's completely wrong. Okay. I don't think experience makes you any better at all. I think okay. evaluated experience is what makes you better. You okay. have somebody who's been doing the same job for 12 years and has never evaluated it, has never been evaluated, and they're doing it exactly the same way they were doing it 12 years ago. Yes. They're, they're no better. That's not, yeah, that's for not sure. excellence, right? Evaluated experience is how you get better. Well, how do you evaluate as the leader? You know, the days of the annual review, I hope, are over in most places. Uh, I think yeah. that is one of the most antiquated and ineffective ways of measuring and evaluating. Uh, once a year, I'm going to try to remember all the things you did right and all the things you did wrong. And I'm going to try to put them all on paper and go over them with you. And for most of you, it's the first time you're ever going to hear about any of this. Give yeah. me a break. Like, could there be a more ineffective way to evaluate <laughs> and measure performance? Um, for, for me, evaluation happens weekly. Okay. And, and that feels weird at first, maybe. But I draw so much of this from the work of David Allen in his, his book, Getting Things Done, which was for a sure. revolutionary book for me when I first okay. read this almost 20 years ago. His model of a weekly review where you're thinking back over the previous week and you're looking through your calendar, you're going through your appointments, the conversations, the projects, what you've done, and you ask three questions. What went right? I'm going to start there. I'm going to celebrate the wins. And this is so yeah. often what business owners and entrepreneurs never do. We do not stop and celebrate our wins. Okay. That's a huge mindset shift that you can make today. Simply start a wins journal. Simply start something where every week you're writing down your wins from the week. On those days when you struggle and you get frustrated and discouraged and you wonder, am I making a difference? Can I really do this? Is this really going to work? You've got data now. Go back to go through your wins journal. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. All of a sudden, you're building confidence, not from emotion, but from data. Data matters. So what went right this week? You're building that. You're learning to identify what you want more of. You're focusing on what you want more of. What went right? What went wrong? What didn't yeah. go the way I expected? Like, where did I screw up? Where did we screw up? Call it out. Identify it. You got to be honest about that. And the last question, how would I do it different next time? How would I make it better? That's where you're processing from the previous week. 
and you're processing what you learned, if you skip that evaluative step, what happens is you're going to move into the next week and the next week and the next month and the next year, and you're going to keep circling the same drains. You're going to keep yeah. making the same mistakes again and again because you never processed it. You never processed through, how would I do it different next time? When you stop and do that every week, the next time you're in a similar situation, you've processed this. You know what you would do different, and you begin to change your course. This is why evaluation matters so much. This is why I yeah. say for my clients, like this is a non-negotiable. You have to do a weekly review because that's how you get better. Yeah. So you're reviewing yourself also in the context of leading a team. You can review the team's progress, what went right, what, you know, what didn't go ideal or to plan. And how would we do it again next time? And this creates that scenario that's described um as as ties in the the continuous yes. improvement process, right? Yes. So it's it's not twelve years doing the the same job, right? In the same way, it's and and actually this um, going back to when I started Breakthrough Marketing Secrets on the front page of the site, I have this video um, that explains a concept from one of my mentors that talks about the power of compound interest on personal improvement. Mm. And it starts at, um, yes. it starts at, at 1% per week. If you just aim yes. for getting 1% better at what you do per week, uh, the first year, it's not 52% better because of compound interest. It's like 68%. And the second year, I think it's like 181% instead of 104. And then the numbers get ridiculous. But this comes from someone who really did become one of the greatest of all time at copywriting um, over the course of a 40 year career, you know, one percent a week becomes like it's to I think it's like 97 billion percent improvement, which seems like, OK, how do we measure that? But at the same time, like that approach is going to make you better. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Now, one of the things <clears throat> leadership itself and the impact that we have as leaders like that can feel intangible, right? Yeah, sure. Um, so flipping the evaluation and measurement towards ourselves as leaders, like how can we measure that? It does feel intangible. And I get yeah. that. And and often that's a little bit of the pushback that I get when people are yeah. like, oh, you coach and mindset and leadership. Well, you can't measure those things. Okay, well, I get why you say that. I think you're wrong. You absolutely can. <laughs> Uh, we measure what matters in our lives. And if you yeah. think I'm wrong, I want you to imagine you just continue to write checks out of your checking account without ever checking your balance. Let me know how <laughs> that goes, okay? You measure what matters, right? Yeah. Imagine saying you're going to continue to make appointments without ever looking at your calendar. <laughs> Let me know how that goes. Okay. You measure what matters. Does leadership matter? Well, we know that it does. We know leadership can be the silver bullet. We know that a leader who moves from simply being mediocre to being a great leader, can th that can make such a dramatic difference on the bottom line of any business. Yeah. Simply by developing that leader's potential into performance. We know that. Yes. Okay. Then how do we measure it? Okay. Well, you define where you are. You define where you want to be. And you get as specific as you possibly can. For each one of the clients that I coach, we, we, we create a dashboard for that client. And on that dashboard, okay. we have areas that we're going to be working on during our time together, during the contracted time that we have with this client. And at any given moment, that client can go to that dashboard and they can see where they started, where they were, and they can see the progress, the progressive steps that we have implemented in their journey so that they know that they are moving. There is never a question, is there any movement? Have we done anything? Have I? Because so often stuff that's going on inside of us, we don't see. You can't read the label when you're in the bottle. Yeah. You need an external dashboard. And that's sure. what we provide. Like we provide that for each one of our clients so that they can see, oh, okay, I wanted to get better in this area. This was a focus area. And we've done this and we've done this and we've done this and we've developed this and we've studied this and we've worked on this. Okay, yeah. Am I where I wanted to be? Wow, yeah. Yeah I, yeah, I didn't realize that. It didn't feel like there's been a change, but what does the data say? Yeah. Here it is. You measure what well, that's. Yeah, that's excellent. That's excellent. So 
Here's another, like, it's great that you mentioned David Allen, because this idea that I had for, for talking about this next question, um, you'll get the David Allen connection. Um, so it's nice to have a job that has a finish line, like a project that you finish and it's you defined deliverables and you create those deliverables and it's done, right? You, you actually make a widget, mm -hmm. right? Bye. And it reaches the end of the assembly line and there's my finished widget, right? Yep. Leadership isn't like that. No. Uh, even if we want it to be, if we think that it should be like that and we operate from that assumption that, oh, leading this team should be like, I let it, we got to the finish line and now the team is like the thing, right? Mm -hmm. But then there's a drift towards mediocrity from resting mm -hmm. on our laurels, from taking that approach. So how do you avoid that drift as a leader? Intentionality is the single word answer to that. You have to be intentional. Okay. The tendency of any person, any leader, any team, any organization, the tendency is over time to settle into a drift. And it's not, yeah. again, out of malicious intent. You know, when you first start a new project or you first start a new job, typically you're in learning mode and you're having to learn a lot of things and like, I got to get this right. But at some point, you're like, okay, I think I got this. And you're, yeah. you're no longer in that that mode where you're learning and listening and everything is, you're hyper aware of everything around you. All of a sudden now you're beginning to coast a little bit. Yeah. You never, ever coast or drift into excellence. You always drift into mediocrity, 100% of the time. Okay, so knowing that, You've got yeah. to be intentional. You've got to be purposeful in this. If if I know there's never a point at which I'm going to stop leading my team, we're going to get to the finish line. There's no finish line. Okay, well, how can I be intentional about this? What does that look like? For me, that looks like that I'm going to have weekly meetings with each one of my direct reports. We're going to talk through what's going on. We're going to do evaluation together. What went right last week? What are you struggling with? What are the things that I can help you with? What do you need most right now? I'm going to know what their goals and their dreams are, because I think one of the highest callings of a leader is to help lift up the people that they lead to achieve the dreams that are in their hearts. Yeah. When you have a leader like that who cares enough about you to know what matters to you, you lean in toward that leader. You lean in toward that team. Because For you sure. feel like you've been seen, you've been heard, you feel like you matter. And if leaders would simply take that one piece and begin to apply it in their teams, they would see a difference in performance that is seemingly unexplainable. The difference yeah. is you. The difference is how you're leading. Yeah. When I flip this around, like going, going back, my first job in marketing at that IT training company, the person that I reported directly to who who actually still listens to these podcasts and will probably hear this. Um, actually, when I showed up on the first day, you know, speaking of commitment, I said, at some point in the future, I am going to be a freelance copywriter and I'm not going to work for you anymore. And for him, I, I guess he'd already internalized that for a season, if not by name, by um, meaning. He said, okay. Well, I'm going to do everything I can to um, get the most out of you while you're here, to make you want to stay here for as long as possible, and to help you build the skills so that when you do that, you're going to be super successful at it too, right? Um, and so what, what happened was they ended up keeping me. I think that I meant to be there for a couple of years. They kept me for four and a half years. <laughs> Wow. And um, continue to create opportunity for me there and continue to create. And it wasn't just me. It was the entire workplace. Right. Uh, and then he, when he moved on from the company, the company struggled to maintain any kind of culture like that because his leadership was about that. It wasn't just about how can we like we had a daily dashboard of numbers that we could look at, but it wasn't just about the daily and the monthly numbers. Yes. It was it was about the entire um, culture and chemistry and um, helping people build their competency for their own futures while getting the most out of them while they were there. Um, yeah. That's when leadership becomes catalytic, Roy. Yeah. That's it. That's when all of a sudden things begin to happen. You're like, this is, this is disproportionate. I'm getting disproportionate results. Why is that? 
is because all of a sudden you're investing in people beyond just what you're going to get from them. Yes. They're not just a cog in the machine of the company. They're an actual 3D human being. For and sure. You, and you want to see them succeed. You want to invest in them and empower them to succeed, not just for what they're doing today for you, but for the rest of their lives. That's excellent. So you talk about personal wiring. Yeah. Um, you, you say discover your wiring as chapter two of your book. Yeah. Uh, how does personal wiring impact your leadership? When when somebody steps into a leadership role, most often they begin, and I certainly started this way, by copying leaders that they admire, leaders that yeah. they've worked for, leaders that they respect or they've seen from afar, and they begin to copy things about them that they think that's what a leader looks like. Makes sense. We all do that at the beginning of our journey. Yeah. The problem is when we stay there, because what's going to happen over time is that you're just going to end up becoming a bad copy of a great leader. <laughs> You have to learn to lead according to your wiring, not theirs. Yeah. And everybody has a little bit different wiring. I use assessments like the, the DISC and the Working Genius Assessment. Both of these will help me to begin to build a framework model of wiring for a leader that I'm going to work with. And yeah. as we as we look at this and we say, okay, you know, the, the simple things that, that we all know from the Myers-Briggs, you know, are you introverted or extroverted? You know, I mean, our, you know, we, we, we understand some things like that. But if you are an introverted leader like I am, I couldn't be any farther on the introverted side mm. of the scale. If if you take somebody who is there and you say, OK, now you if you're going to lead, you have to lead like an extrovert. What's yeah. going to happen? We know what's going to happen. They're going to burn out. They're going to flame out over time because they're operating outside of their wiring. That's not how they're yeah. wired. Don't you can't do that to somebody. That's not the best. What's the best is understanding how they are wired and then learning how to lead, how to influence from there. Yes. Using the gifts and the skills and the passions and the talents and the experiences that you have according to your wiring. That's what I work with leaders on to discover that and learn to lead from there. And so it's it, like it's not so much about installing William's system or Roy's system yeah. or whatever. It's about it's about recognizing, OK, William. And this is one of the things I like to I like to teach from a place of principles and strategy above techniques and tactics, because yes. if if you figure out, OK, uh, Roy has a system that worked and here's the principle behind it. And William has this system that worked and here's the principle behind it. And this leader has this system that worked and here's the principle and go through. Then you can adapt, especially the principles towards your own unique wiring. Right. And then yes. and then say, OK. I love this, but it doesn't work exactly like they say, because I'm not them. Yes, right? exactly. Um, and so I'm going to change it. And here's how, you know, my version that's, uh, you know, 10% different works perfectly for me. Yeah. Right. And it's the same, same outcome, same goal, the slightly different approach. Right. That's exactly cool. It. I, I want to talk about one last question here. Mm -hmm. Um, you talk about being a conduit and not just a reservoir of what you've experienced and learned from others. So what does that mean? And how do you do that? How does that influence your leadership? Mm. You know, I think, I think that it's a choice that each one of us has that we make every day. You have experiences, right? You have things that have happened in your life up to this point. You have things that you've learned from other people, things that you've learned from books, from podcasts, from, from speeches that you've heard, things that people have poured into and invested in you. Right? Yes. You are the sum of all of that. That brings you to the point where you are today with the expertise that you have. And the question is, are you just going to be a reservoir of all of that? Is all yeah. of that just for you? Everything you've experienced, everything you've learned, all the insights, all the wisdom, are you going to hold that in and keep that? And that's just for me. And if I begin to share it, then you get to benefit from it. And you might take that and, oh, no, no, that's just for me. Yeah. That's an option. That's That's reservoir. I believe there's a better way. When you move into being a conduit, that means you understand that there's no such thing as an experience in your life that is wasted. There's no such thing as an experience in your life that is just for you. There's no insight or wisdom that you learn or gain from someone else or from your own journey that's just for you. Yeah. You begin to learn that you can be a conduit of that and share those with other people to help them where they are. When you begin to adopt that model, all of a sudden, you're adding value to people 
And it's not because of anything you're going to get out of it. Yeah. It's for and, their benefit. And I think that, you know, that what you notice if you start to apply this as a, as a principle going forward is that even though you're never doing it for what you're going to get out of it, it comes back around. Yes, it um, does. Yeah. Um, I, I love that as an idea. And thank you for being a conduit of your leadership experience uh, throughout this, this interview. So you have this great book, Catalytic Leadership. Um, and we touched on a few of the ideas from that, but there's a lot more uh, bound up in, in, in a very small and value-packed package. Um, and you're offering a free copy to Break Your Marketing Secrets uh, listeners. So can you tell more a little bit about that? Um, and then we'll direct people to, well, the link will be in the description, but it's catalyticleadershipbook.com, catalyticleadershipbook.com. Um, so can you uh, just, just give us a sense of what we're going to find as we dive in? Absolutely. The, the conversations that I've had with people that I've been coaching, leaders that I've been coaching for the last 20, 25 years, if, yeah. if you look at them in a macro level, you see there are threads that run through, common threads that run through so many of those conversations, so many of those engagements. And what I've tried to do in the book is capture 12 of those threads. Things okay. that I've seen again and again in people, no matter where they're leading, whether it's a C-suite executive or whether it's a solopreneur, whether it's a military leader or whether it's you know an entrepreneur running a, a million or $2 million business, there are threads. And the yeah. threads are consistent in your leadership. And what I wanted to do was take that and package that in such a way that it's it's like you and I are having a conversation across a cup of across a table, having a cup of coffee together. And it's very conversationally written in that intention. I want people to benefit from this because if they can avoid some of the ditches that I have hit and that other people that I've worked with have hit in their journeys, yeah, how much how much the better is that for them in what they're trying to accomplish and who they're leading. Yeah. Bingo. Yeah. So uh, you you set aside a few free copies and you've paid for them. Uh, mm -hmm. So all that people have to do is cover the cost of shipping and you will uh, you'll mail the book out to them. That That is assuming that they're in the U.S. Um, based on shipping charges, you do also offer a digital copy uh, for international uh, international folks, listeners, viewers, whatever. Um, so that's at catalyticleadershipbook.com. Again, always the best thing to do is just open up the description and tap it or click that link to catalyticleadershipbook.com uh, to get your free copy. Dr. William Attaway, thank you so much for being on Breakthrough Marketing Secrets for this interview and sharing, being that conduit for your leadership, uh, wisdom, and experience. Roy, it's been an honor to be here, truly. I've so enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. And to everyone who has watched or listened, uh, I would, I, I want you to share one big takeaway, one action item. You can leave a comment with this episode or just let me know what are you going to do as a result of this episode. I'm Roy Fur. This is Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. Always appreciate you. And I'll catch you again in the next episode. I'll see you soon. Thank you once again for tuning in to this daily episode of Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. Remember, check out the links with this episode for even more value. Now make sure you like, comment, share, subscribe, and engage in every way you can to keep this show going and growing and delivering daily value to you. I'll catch you soon for your next big breakthrough.